Thank you for coming to this event. Um, I'm going to be talking about my new book, The Pattern Seekers. This uh, explores a big question. Uh, is there a link between autism and the capacity for invention? And what I hope to do is lay out the evidence that shows some links. But before I do that, uh, let's turn to a related question. Uh, when did invention begin? So what's clear is that our hominid ancestors could use simple stone tools. So in that sense, we could say they could invent. For example, Homo habilis uh, and Homo erectus, who both lived about two million years ago, could use stone axes and stone hammers. Uh, and so could the Neanderthals, who lived as recently as 40,000 years ago. Uh, but despite small changes in the design of their tools, as you can see, for millions of years, there was very little evidence for what I call generative invention. That's to say the ability to invent in multiple ways, not just um, as a one-off. And if we look at non-human species uh, alive today, a lot of animals can use simple stone tools. So the question is, you know, can they invent? Chimpanzees, for example, can use a rock as a hammer to crack a nut. Uh, and you can see here that crows can drop a stone into uh, water to raise the water level to be able to reach a worm. Uh, both intelligent behavior, uh, but I think that the behavior of other animals and indeed of our hominid ancestors can be parsimoniously explained as the result of associative learning, forming an association between two things, A and B. But this doesn't show, doesn't lead to or show any sign of generative invention. Uh, but then suddenly, 70,000 to 100,000 years ago, when Homo sapiens was on the scene, the rate of invention suddenly takes off, as you can see in this uh, schematic timeline. And generative invention has been unstoppable ever since. What we see suddenly is the capacity for generative invention, not just inventing once, but generating nonstop. And I argue that this is because a cognitive revolution had occurred in the human brain. So what was this cognitive revolution? Well, I argue that there were two new circuits in the human brain. And the first of these is what I call the systemizing mechanism. So this allowed humans to look for special patterns in the world that I call if and then patterns. And these are the basis uh, of, of any system that if I take something and I do something to it, then I get a particular outcome. And the systemizing mechanism allowed us to analyze the world to find such patterns and then to confirm if they hold true. And to do this, we repeat our observations over and over again. Uh, and once they're confirmed, we can then vary the pattern by experimenting either with the if or the and. And I'll show you some examples of this in a second. But when we produce a new if and then pattern. That's what I'm calling uh, uh, an invention. And I borrow this terminology from the 19th century logician, George Boole, who you can see in this cartoon illustration, uh, who analyzed the structure of, of human thought. So um, we can infer the existence of the systemizing mechanism in the modern human brain, because 75,000 years ago, we see the first jewelry. And if we try and imagine what was going on in the mind of the inventor of this complex tool, he or she might have thought, if I make a hole in each shell and thread a string through each hole, then the shells will form a necklace. So if and then reasoning as long ago as 75,000 years ago. And 71,000 years ago, we see the first bow and arrow Again, the same if and then algorithm is evident that if I attach an arrow to a stretchy fiber and release the tension in the fiber, then the arrow will fly. 
And uh, 40,000 years ago, we see uh, the earliest musical instrument that's ever been found, a flute made from a hollow bone. Again, imagine the reasoning in the ancestor who made this, that if I blow down the hollow bone and cover one hole, then I make a specific sound. But if I blow down the hollow bone and cover two holes, then I make a different sound. So our ancestor had invented a complex tool, a musical instrument, and a system of sounds that we call music. And invention didn't stop there, obviously. 40,000 years ago, we see uh, cave paintings. 25,000 years ago, we see these remarkable sculptures. By by 12,000 years ago, uh, we see the invention of agriculture. And again, think about this if and then reasoning that if I take a tomato seed and plant it in moist soil, then I get a tomato plant. And of course, the invention of agriculture transformed our diet, our health health and our lifestyles. And of course, fast forward to 2021, we are still inventing unstoppably today. A recent example is the invention of the vaccine if I take the genes for COVID spike protein and put them into a harmless virus, then I have a vaccine against COVID as just one example. But let's go back 75,000 years ago because the systemizing mechanism explains how we could invent, how we could make the first jewelry. But the empathy circuit explains why we made it. We wear jewelry because we can imagine what someone else might think or feel. We might imagine that they are thinking that if we wear jewelry, it makes us more beautiful. It makes us look like we're of higher status. Or we might make jewelry as a gift, to give as a gift, because we could imagine that the other person uh, might feel happy. And the evolution of the empathy circuit allowed a whole raft of complex social interactions, including deception, and referential communication. But let's go back to our big question. Is there a link between autism and invention? Anecdotally, there's uh, lots of stories um, about inventors uh, who have a high level of autistic traits. So this is Thomas Edison, who famously invented the first electric light bulb, but he was inventing nonstop. Uh, As a teenager, he was obsessed with Morse code, a system of patterns, and he even named his children Dot and Dash. And his wife moved a mattress into his workshop so that he he could carry on inventing and experimenting day and night. And here is Glenn Gould, the uh, pianist, again, an inventor of musical patterns, but who showed a lot of autistic traits by the way we would think about them today. For example, he always had to have the same chair at exactly the same height uh, in every concert. And after every concert, always went to the same restaurant and sat at the same table and ordered exactly the same food at exactly the same time at two o'clock in the morning. So a lot of patterns of autistic traits. Equally, anecdotally, We know that a lot of autistic people are very good at pattern recognition, have a talent in pattern recognition and understanding systems. This is Max Park, who is autistic, and despite his social difficulties, he's the number one world champion in the Rubik's Cube, which is a system of visual patterns. This is Derek Paravicini, who is autistic, congenitally blind and has learning difficulties, but who can play any song on the piano after hearing it just once. And this is Daniel Tammet, who is autistic and has something called synesthesia or a mixing of the senses. And he is the European champion for memorizing the number pi to 22,400 decimal places. So he is fascinated by systems of numbers. But anecdotes um, are not evidence. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below.
Or visit IAI.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.